kids can change the world. All they need is little inspiration. And they get inspiration from successful people. Their success stories motivate them, inspire them, and allow them to believe that there is no limit to what we can do. There are a number of success stories. And Sunita Williams is one such successful person, a role model and a source of inspiration for many. Let us have a peep in a truly inspiring story of a space lady. A story of a woman who played multiple roles. The role of a naval aviator, helicopter pilot, naval diver, swimmer, an animal lover, marathon runner, and above all, an astronaut. Sunita was born on September 19, 1965 in Ohio. Her paternal ancestry originates in Gujarat, India, and that of her mother in Slovenia. Sunita was selected as an astronaut by NASA in 1998. She has spent a total of 322 days in space on two missions. She was awarded two Navy Commendation Medals, a Navy and Marine Corps Achievement Medal, a Humanitarian Service Medal and various other service awards. Sunita Williams was honored by National Science Center for her extraordinary achievements. She was here in India to interact with students and to share her experiences. Now let us listen to her experiences as a commander of Expedition 33. Uh, it's a great honor to be here at the science centers throughout India. So if, if you indulge me for just about 15 minutes or so, I have a video. The video, you'll see our crews. You will also see our, some training. Um, and I, I'll talk through it a little bit. You'll see a uh, launch from where we launch nowadays is in Baikonur in Kazakhstan, because uh, we launch on a Russian spacecraft as part of our international relationship. Um, you'll also see some spacewalks, some visiting vehicles, and just what it's like to live and work in space. Um, so if you're ready for that, I'm ready to start, and I'll do a little narrating. Does that sound good? Okay. So these are our two crews. As you can see, we switch out crews halfway through. At the end of training, we always get cake. There's always a reward by the end of training. Training is two and a half years. It consists of a lot of um, emergency training, some food tasting, some training for spacewalks. Um, here's our food tasting, as a matter of fact. No samosas for food tasting. We just already, we already knew that they were good. Um, we were getting ready, like I said, to train for one spacewalk, which was planned, but we ended up doing three. Uh, here we are in the Russian segment of the space station, getting ready for uh, emergency training. This is uh, getting ready for spacewalks. You can see the suit that we wear under the space suits. Um, and here we are at the pool, getting ready to practice our neutral buoyancy lab, the actual uh, things that we are going to perform out in space. Training ends in Russia. Uh, so here we are at Star City and in Red Square where we put flowers on the grave of Yuri Gagarin. And then we head down to Baikonur in Kazakhstan. One of the, there's many traditions and one of the traditions is signing the doors of the uh, rooms that we stay in at the crew quarters in Kazakhstan. There's been over 400 people going to space. So Aki's door was pretty filled up and he got a brand new door. And you can see he's also signing in Japanese. He speaks English, Russian, and Japanese. We all speak some Russian and the cosmonauts speak some English. So you see myself signing my door in both English and Russian. 
and hieroglyphics, you might say. Lots of traditions, planting trees, as well as a press conference with our backup crew, Chris Hadfield, the Canadian on the right-hand side. This is the morning of launch, and I refer to this as the last shower for four months. <laughs> but, um, I was telling folks earlier, it um, doesn't really matter what religion you are, you're just happy to be blessed before you get on a rocket. So we were all happy to be blessed. This is the morning of launch, about four hours before launch. Uh, we launched at 8.30 in the morning, so that was about four in the morning. We go out to get our suits on, to do a pressure check, and then um, get a little pat on the butt for good luck. <laughs> More tradition as we get ready to uh, launch on the rocket. Just a view of what Kazakhstan is like if you have not been there. This area is particularly flat, which is very nice. Uh, lots of wild camels and wild horses, as well as our family and friends who came to watch. Two, one. Lift off. Lift off of the Soyuz TMA 05M carrying Sonny Williams, Yuri Lelenchenko, and Aki Hochide on a two day journey to the International Space Station. You can tell it's uh, pretty smooth just from the picture right there. This is a liquid engine, so it's not solid rocket boosters like the shuttle was, so the ride inside is really quite smooth. Um, right in the right hand corner, you can see Yuri's daughter's doll. Uh, that is our talisman as well as our gravity indicator. When it starts floating, we know that we're up in space. This is the docking mechanism as we're getting ready to dock to the International Space Station. So two days after launch, we open up the hatch and here we are at the station, a much bigger place than our small little VW Soyuz. Um, so we get to, right away we uh, have a little fun, but then we get to work. Immediately we're getting ready for the Japanese vehicle HTV to get there as well as doing a lot of medical experiments on ourselves. Uh, we're, there's a lot of investigation in uh, vision and eyes, what happens to sp in space, as well as blood and urine samples that we take on ourselves. Uh, there's some thoughts that intracranial pressure is changing potentially our vision up there, so it's very important that we try to understand and find out what's going on. So we're our own doctors. Our, we do our own medical stuff while we're up there. This is a freezer where we save our blood and urine samples. And we also do a lot of maintenance. You know, it's like your house. We're the only plumbers, electricians, IT guys, so we, we're sort of the jack of all trades. Uh, we also have to remember what it's like to come home. I was practicing for descent as well as doing science experiments. Uh, we had our friend Robot up there, which is in conjunction with um, GM and NASCAR to try to understand really fine robotics on hands, as a matter of fact. We had a couple live little friends. We had two spiders from Egypt, uh, Cleopatra and Nefertiti. Uh, we also had a bunch of fish from Japan. Um, but again, we knew one of the most important things we were going to get to do was a spacewalk to change out one of the electrical boxes on the outside of that space station. So here we are getting ready in our suits. Aki's on the end of the robotic arm right here. Um, the box right by my head was the one that uh, actually ended up causing a little bit of problems. We end up having to do two spacewalks to get that box changed out. Uh, Joe's driving the robotic arm right here. Um, we also did then a third spacewalk to work on an ammonia leak. So we were quite busy while we were up there with spacewalks, which um, ended up creating all that hours outside. But the team on the ground was the one who came up with this final uh, method of cleaning the bolt and trying to get the electrical box installed. Remember, there's thousands of people that are on the ground that are trying to help us uh, be successful in the things that we are doing up there. That's a little bit happenstance. <laughs> But all, all good. Spacewalking is a lot of fun. You can see here, that's the airlock. This is our final look outside in space before we came in for our last time. And um, here we are in our liquid cooling garment. In the meantime, our Russian compadres were getting ready for their spacewalk. Uh, one of the things that they did was deploy this satellite. It's a pretty neat satellite. It was able to be tracked by the folks on the ground, and that allows them to make a math model with empirical data about what happens when space debris starts to fall apart. You know, for example, satellites start to fall apart, and then you want to track where the pieces are going to come into the atmosphere. So it's a pretty neat experiment by them. Um, I think there's a slew of experiments that are like that that they're working on. 
They're also getting ready to add another module like I was talking about. So while they were outside, as we call it, outside on a spacewalk, Yuri and Gennady moved a couple cranes to get ready to deploy one of their modules. One of their modules is actually going to be disconnected this year and, uh, and sent away for, for, to make room for the new module. This is a Japanese satellite. Actually, they had micro satellites that we deployed. Uh, we deployed them on the 55th anniversary of the Sputnik uh, satellite, so that was sort of sort of neat to change of, 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 of plan there. Um, we also had a bunch of visiting vehicles. Like I mentioned, the European Space uh, Agency ATV, the SpaceX module right here, which is a U.S. commercial vehicle, as well as uh, HTV, the Japanese vehicle. So we do what we call track and capture with the robotic arm. We drive the robotic arm to grab these spacecraft which are hovering next to the International Space Station. And then we're able to uh, dock them to the space station and take out uh, supplies that they bring and then load them up with trash. Or in the case of SpaceX, we're able to load those blood and urine samples and even the spiders to return back to Earth. So it's a pretty dynamic time while we were up there. We had lots of things coming and going. It was a big, a lot of traffic, as you might call it, uh, up on the space station. Again, just like Gennady said, I want to thank everybody on the ground for preparing us. Uh, but most of all, for the last two months, I would like to thank our 32 crewmates here who have taught us how to live and work in space, and of course, to have a lot of fun up in space. So Gennady and his crew, um, it was their time to leave, so they got into their spacecraft. Uh, the Soyuz and landed for this nice soft landing out in the steppes of Kazakhstan. Left us with just three of us on the space station. Um, it was pretty empty up there because like, like I said, this is the size of a 747. So we had a lot of space to fly around in, which was nice, but it was a little bit lonely. So you might have seen some of this on YouTube, but this is sort of how you live and work in space, which continues no matter who's there. Not really, because it doesn't matter. You don't really have the sensation of lying down. You just sit in your sleeping bag. So here's one sleep station right here. I'm going in right now. You can follow me if you want. So I'm inside. It's sort of like a little phone booth. Um, but it's pretty comfy. I've got a sleeping bag right here that we sleep in so we don't have a, sort of like a little bit of a cover. We don't fly all over the place. Um, but you know, you can sleep in any orientation. I have it sleeping, feeling like I'm standing up right now, but like you saw, I'm on the floor, but it doesn't matter if I turn over and I sleep upside down. I can't have it, I don't have any sensation in my head that tells me that I'm upside down, so it really doesn't matter. The sleep station is also like a little office. We've got a computer in here. As you can see, we've got a couple little toys. I've got some books. I've got some clothes and other things that make it sort of like home. So there are four sleep stations in this area. And you can see I'm demonstrating. And then there's two in the back of the space station. So rooms for all six of us. I know that there's some questions about how to use the bathroom, and how do you actually live in space like normal? Like at home, I mentioned real quickly about getting up in the morning and brushing your teeth and washing your face. Well, how do you do that? Well, here is the bathroom, essentially. You get up in the morning, and we have a little kit, and it has all the essential things that you need, like your toothbrush and toothpaste and brush. See how, see how much better the brush makes my hair look? <laughs> A lot of people ask about toothbrush and toothpaste. So, luckily enough, toothpaste, you can do it upside right this way, is sticky, and so it sticks to your toothbrush, no problem. Another cool thing is that water sticks to your toothbrush, too. If you can see it, I'll have some water come out. The water is pretty neat up in space. It'll stick to your toothbrush and it will make whoop, a big bubble. And that's just by surface tension. And then you can drink it. So a lot of people ask about what do you do 
with the toothpaste after you brush your teeth. Two options. Swallow it, and it's sort of like mouthwash. But it tastes a little gross. Or you can just spit it out in a paper towel, and then you don't have to worry about it. One of the most pressing questions about using being living in space, of course, is the bathroom. So let's take a look at that little piece of work. Here we are at the throne. This is awesome. You might see the little, um, you might have noticed the little moon on the outside. This is our orbital outhouse right here. And of course, it serves for two functions. Number two, right here. I'll show you. But you see it's pretty small, so you have to have pretty good aim. And you'll be, be, be ready to make sure things get let go the right direction. And it smells a little bit, so I'm closing it up. And that's, of course, for number two. And this guy right here is for number one. So they're sort of two slightly separate functions, but you can do a little, essentially both, by hanging on right here and doing number one and number two. I might add it's color-coded, so you really don't get it mixed up, which is nice. This is yellows for number one. And also, there's a selection of paper. People always ask about toilet paper. What do you do with toilet paper? What kind of toilet paper do you have? We have gloves just because sometimes it does get messy. We have some Russian wipes, which are a little bit coarse if you like the coarse type of toilet paper. We have some nice tissues, which are nice and soft if you like soft toilet paper. We have huggies um, just for any cleanup. You know, we were all babies once, and this sort of helps. And then as things get really out of control, we have uh, disinfectant wipes just to make sure we clean up here. Because, you know, just like the water I showed you, the number one stuff can sort of go all over the place if you don't aim correctly. And did I mention, both of these have a little bit of suction, so they should keep things going in the right direction. But, um, like I said, sometimes things get a little out of control if you are out of control yourself flying around. So we have lots of protective stuff. And of course, you do have your privacy. There's a little door. Here's a pretty cool place. This is sort of like in your house where everybody meets in the morning. Uh, after you wash your face, brush your teeth, you want to find something for breakfast. And this is our kitchen. You might notice there's all sorts of foods here. Uh, it's like opening the refrigerator. You got all your different stuff that you want to have. Drinks, meats, eggs, vegetables, cereals, uh, bread, uh, snacks. And that's a good place. That's where you find all the candy. Uh, side dishes and then some little power bars just in case. So we have all this type of food. Some of it is dehydrated and so we have to hydrate it, fill it up with water. Some of it is all ready made and then all we have to do is heat it up. So something like this, I'm pulling out barbecued beef brisket. Pretty yummy. Not only is this food made in the U.S., but we also have food here from Japan. Uh, we've got Russian food. As you can see, all these red containers are filled with food that's from Russia. Um, and then we get some of our specialty stuff, some things that we like, some of our favorite stuff that your family can send up. In fact, I like fluffernutters, and so I got sent up some fluff so I could make my fluffernutter with peanut butter. So you have a lot of food up here, no problems. Um, a friend of mine calls it the black hole because you can go there and you can just want to stay there forever looking at the beautiful planet that we live on. Um, just a couple things like Caribbean, you saw a hurricane, you see the western part of the U.S. for example here, Baja California. And then you say to yourself, okay, I'll be done as soon as the sun goes down. 
But then you realize how cool the planet is at night, checking out the different lights and then checking out the stars and you end up being there forever and not working. So it's a little bit dangerous. That's why we call it the, the black hole. And with that, time goes so fast. Four months were over in a heartbeat and it was time for us to come home. We, we handed over the space station to Egg, uh, Kevin, Oleg, and Yevgeny, and we got back into our Soyuz. You could see from when we came in, and now we're come, going back out. Um, it takes only uh, about four hours after undocking. This is our display as we're undocking. That's our spacecraft flying away from the space station before we hit the ground. Um, after we hit the ground, you could probably see that the, the vehicle there is a little bit charred up. Um, the folks pull us out. It was like minus 13 degrees. We were still nice and toasty in our spacesuits, though. Uh, we're able to walk, but uh, they're a little bit worried about neurovestibular effects at that point in time, and so they give you a little bit of a hand. Um, but after they pull us out, we get out of our spacesuits. We actually get into an ATV, ride over to our helicopter, get in our helicopter for about a two hour ride to a local airport, and then get in a, uh, an airplane and go all the way home. So about 24 hours after landing, Aki and I were back in the United States, and Yuri was back in Moscow uh, to start our uh, rehab recovery uh, actions for about 45 days. And then, uh, and then we're back to normal, I think. <laughs> as far as I can tell, I think we're all back to normal. So that's... I think India has a huge resource of people who are uh, able and willing to get involved in the space program. ISRO uh, has a lot going on. We are in collab collaborations uh, with India to uh, work on uh, space exploration together. So I think that's really encouraging to me is I hope there will be another Kalpna Chavla out there who will be uh, going into space before too long. This was her experience of Expedition 33. Quite inspiring and motivating, isn't it? Wing Commander Rakesh Sharma, the first Indian astronaut, said something about Sunita Williams. And he said that Sunita Williams comes across as an ordinary person who realized her extraordinary potential by sheer dint of hard work and can-do attitude. With the hope that this glimpse in her life will motivate students to say, I can instead of can I will take your leave. And we'll see you in our next episode, Sunita Williams in conversation with students.